Welcome, with a big apology for being late. My name is Sebastian Thuan of Udacity. It's my great pleasure to open our new series of Udacity Talks, where we invite innovators and inventors from Silicon Valley, accomplished people, to talk to us and to our students worldwide. Today, it's my great honor to have with me my good friend Tony Fidel, CEO and founder of Nest, the inventor of the iPod, and many other wonderful things to come and join us and, ask, and mostly answer your questions as I get them online from you in this session. Before I do this, I want to ask him a few personal questions and see um, what, what insight you can share with us. I want to go, Tony, it's great to have you here. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, it's awesome to be here, and it's awesome to be the first, first guest ever. You're the first guest ever. I like it. And hopefully we're going to resolve those technical problems in the later iterations of this show. We'll see. <laughs> I'm sure you will. I want to go back to the very beginnings, to 1987, when you enrolled as an engineering student. How come you wanted to be an engineer? Well, I wanted to be an engineer all the way from, I think, about fourth grade. So for me, my education, my technical education, started with my grandfather when I was three years old. He was a superintendent of schools. He was an educator, a principal. And he trained me in how to work with my hands to create things with woods and metals and glass and all kinds of things. We would repair lawnmowers and bicycles and build soapbox derby racers and, and birdhouses and things. So I got into building things. And then in 1979, this crazy, I started learning about this crazy thing called a computer. I was only 10 years old at the time, and I said, I want one of those. And my grandfather said, that's a tool, just like a hammer, just like a wrench. And I said, I really want that. He never touched a computer in his life, but he said, that's a tool, it's the future, and he helped me buy that and first and computer. You, you lived in Detroit at that time, is that correct? Yeah, I lived in Detroit. Where yeah. the cars were being made. Where cars were being made. And now cars are being taken over by Silicon Valley, eventually. Uh, by you. <laughs> <laughs> by Tesla and many other great people. Well, you started it. <laughs> so what, what, what did an engineering education look like 30 years ago? Well, hmm. education for, for me was, you know, the, uh, the traditional education was you went to school, you, you know, you, there's 30 people in a class, and you just got, you know, told like, okay, here's differential equations or here's computer science or what have you. But there was no learning by doing. There were no projects, really. It was you read the book, you took the tests, and that's how it went. Um, today, you know, there's, and there was no resources besides the library. Today, we have, you know, we have Google and the vast internet. We have things, you know, courses like uh, Udacity. We have uh, online collaboration. So it's so dramatically different, and it's so crazy that the things my sons are learning today I didn't learn until I was, you know, in my 20s or my, my teens. It's crazy. It's wonderful. So for you, the biggest education was actually your grandfather. That's where it all started. Even though he was not accredited, I guess. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, not accredited. And tell me, how did you make the shift from the education college into your career? Well, all the way from the first days in, in, in high school, I started companies. So I knew that I wanted to be an engineer because I was starting companies that were engineering based and I needed a more formal training. So I learned by doing. And so for me, the way I knew I wanted to go to school was because I was doing things and then I was hitting walls because I didn't know all the things I needed to know. And so I think that's the right way to be educated today is you want to do something, you go off and do it, and then you learn the things you need to know to do it pr at a high proficiency so level. That makes me really wonder, what was your first company? Well, my first business, excuse me, my first business was selling, egg, selling eggs to my, my, the neighbors. Ah. But my first, my first real company was an educational uh, software company and mail order company. Great. We were programming software and, and selling Apple II hardware. And how old were you when you did this? So I was uh, in 11th grade, so I was, uh, you know, about 16 or 17. So it's child labor, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> I was the boss, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. And you, you grew this business. Did you have ever employees working for you in this business? Yeah, so we had, uh, uh, so we, there was two of us who, who did the business, and then we had, we probably put on four or five people. And then ultimately, I went to college, and they still continued running the business, and they had like 40 or 50 people. And so then it ultimately sold. I'm so glad you went to college and later on invented the iPod with that, took the iPad and, and eventually to the iPhone, which is great. Well, it takes a team, but yeah, it was wonderful times. Absolutely wonderful times. Sometime time. in life you also worked in this building, in this very building, right? Yes. Uh, in Sorry. 1991, I had my very first job in this very building, just one floor down, working with the Mac team, the team that created the Mac without Steve Jobs at General Magic. And I was learning from my heroes. And, you know, you learn in school how to code, 
But here you, you, at General Edge, I learned how to build products and the process of creating things to take to market. And it was a phenomenal experience. I want to ask uh, you some questions that our students uh, sent us uh, to Adversity ahead of this uh, show. And here's the first one uh, from a student named Lucas. How do I know when to leave everything behind and follow my dream? <laughs> it's a very broad <laughs> question. I'm sure you have a, a long answer to this. Well, I have a long answer, but you know, it's, it. I followed my dream right here to this building. <laughs> so I left Michigan. I had a startup company at the time, and I felt in my heart of hearts like I was this big fish in a small pond. So in Michigan, before there were startups and everything and funding, I had heard about Silicon Valley. And I, in my gut, everything told me I had been tapped out. My startup company was okay, but I wasn't learning anything. And I wanted to go where there were brilliant people that I could learn from. I wanted to work for my heroes. And so my gut told me, run to Silicon Valley, and I begged to get into General Magic, and I was like so employee you, number 30. You basically got a Greyhound ticket, sat in the bus for 30 hours from, from Detroit to Silicon Valley. With $400 and to my name, and I came out here and... And I mean, did you knock on doors, or what did you do? So uh, literally, I knocked on the door at General Magic at the time at 8 in the morning. Uh, we had, I had a tie on. This is Silicon, I didn't know any better, right? I had my tie on. I go, at, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go ask for a job. And literally the people in the, in the offices had been there the whole night. There was nobody there at eight in the morning except these two people who had been there all night. And they looked at me and I said, you gonna have, can I get hired? And they're like, they didn't even know what to say. They're like, uh, no, we're not hiring. Come back you know, later, kid. And I came back two months later and I kept knocking on the door and knocking on the door and they finally gave me a so job. So it wasn't your college degree or your credentials or your recommendations, it was your persistence? It was the persistence and the experience that I had because I actually had been doing things. It was not about your college degree. It wasn't about where you were from or your, or it was the passion and, and enough experience. They said, this is a young kid. He made it happen. He's out here to make, to, to make his dream happen. So when you talk to, to this guy, gentleman, Lucas, who asked, how do you know when to leave everything behind? How, how do you know that? How do you know? For me, well, there's, there's a, you know, you have two halves of your brain. You have the rational part of your brain right. and you have the emotional part of the brain. At some point, you have to, you can't, there's no re rational way you can assess when you want to just take a leap and throw everything behind. It has to be purely emotion. So it's gut. It's totally gut. Now you have to just don't, not follow just always so your you gut. Have you to have to that. listen to your gut, but you have to really um, make sure you know a little bit about the risks and make sure that, you, you know, that you're not going to be out on the street or what have you, but enough so that you go, I'm going to take the leap. It's true, you had $400. You had all I had $400, and my, my mom and my dad were crying in the driveway as I was leaving. That doesn't even get you a one-night hotel room in Silicon Valley these days. Yeah, not, not in Silicon Valley. <laughs> Back then it did, okay. but not now. Let me ask a question from Konstantinos, another gentleman on the Udacity Network. Again, a very broad question. What is the best piece of advice, of career advice, you've ever received from a mentor in your life? So I've had a few, I've had many mentors in my life, and I've been very, uh, uh, you know, sp lucky to have the, those mentors. But for me, um, two, two big, big things. One is you must always be learning. You know, in this field, I don't know how many languages come and go in computer programming, right? It was, it was Pascal, yeah. then, object, uh, then Objective Pascal, and C, and C++. No, plus plus so, right? You and I are dating yeah, ourselves. Dating ourselves. I with started Pascal. with Fortran and Watt by Fortran. <laughs> me too. Really? <laughs> and okay. basic. And ba oh, of, <laughs> of course, course, that's where I started was basic. <laughs> But now it's Java, JavaScript, Perl, you know, you name it. You always have to continually learn. So for like nano degrees, if you're, in, if you're well employed, you should be doing nano degrees because you have to constantly learn. So that was the first thing my mentor told me is because nice. this, 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 this technology field moves so rapidly. The second thing is know when to say no. Now that must be hard. It's very hard. How, how did you learn how to say no? Well, I learned it from Steve Jobs. How so? Steve, Steve said, you know, we, you know, people ask, you know, there's so many things you could be doing. And his job was to say no to so many things and yes to only the things that really mattered. So you have to really be able to focus your effort, your passion, your emotion, your energy on those things because you can only do something so well uh, if you focus. And so that means saying no to many a things. As you move on through life, if I may ask this question, does it become harder or easier to say no? I, well, for me now, it's harder. Why? It's harder because I have very few constraints in my life. 
right? I mm -hmm. have a great family, I have just about everything. And now when you have no constraints, it's very hard because the world's your oyster. You can do anything you want. When, when, you're, when, when you have only a certain amount of uh, things, that's already narrowed the things you can choose from. Yeah. And you still have to say no within that, right? But you have to know to when to say no. Yeah. No, and when to say yes. But you're going to say true. no much more than yes. And yeah, and be consistent, I'm, I bet. Yes. Uh, we have students from all around the world, from all countries. It's quite amazing. Here's a student named Bharat. And he's asking you, what helps you, Tony, to constantly invent? Is this the knowledge of things or is it the lack of knowledge? Is it more creativity or is it more consistency? Well, I think it's two things. I think it's a great question. The first one is about curiosity. It's being curious. And the other one is being frustrated. So curio curiosity and frustration. So you want to, when you're frustrated, then you're curious as to why am I frustrated? And you clue into those things so you can figure out what's wrong and then fix it. And then your frustration goes away. So it first starts for me with frustration or with curiosity, and those blend together. Most people that I know are frustrated are just grumpy. Grumpy little man. <laughs> you know me very well. Yeah. I know you really well, Tony. <laughs> but I want to tell our students, what is the difference between just being frustrated and what do you do? Well, the, the difference is, is being frustrated, uh, recognizing that, and then taking that emotion and turning it to the positive light to then go, why is it this way? So you can always just run around and complain about everything, right. but you have to take it, harness that energy, turn it into positive, be curious, learn why it is, and sometimes you'll find out the reason why it is is because of the constraints at the time. And so if you look a lot of the things in the world, they were designed 10, 20, 30 years ago. They are not a modern design. And that's where you can actually figure out where you can innovate and create a new business or a new product or what have you to make the world a better place. Because most times, most things were created much, you know, back 20, 10, 20 years ago. Tony, I think you just very beautifully articulated what I think Silicon Valley is all about. What you just said is so rings true with me and you said it so nicely. This is and, really great. And this is exactly what caused you to uh, re uh, re uh, re revolutionize education. Question from Rahul. Would you advise someone to go out and get some experience working in the real world before looking at founding a startup? Or should you just straight jump into starting a startup company? Look, you have to learn by doing. Absolutely, you must learn by doing. I, I, I've done both startups with no experience and I just jumped into it, and I've learned by failure. So my whole life, you know, people see it the last kind of 15 years of my life as lots of success. But the first 15 years of my life, or 20 years of life, was trying startup after startup and failing and failing. And so I would just go off and do it because my gut told me to. But then I learned, I'm like, wait a second, I need other resources, I need to learn other things. And so what I've, and they, and they say, oh, you need to work for a big company, you need to work for your own company or work for a startup. There's no one path. But what you always have to be doing is learning and trying to adapt even under pressure when, there, when you have failure. So for me, the way I think about it is, wherever you start, make sure you take an alternate path. So if you start with a big company, then go to a small company and see the differences. Or if you start your own startup, then go work with a startup that's already functioning. You're going to find that you're going to bounce around a lot, and you're going to learn in all those different environments. And then one day, your gut's going to tell you, I have enough experience, and I have enough, um, and I have enough passion, emotion, my gut's telling you, and you'll strike out, you'll have the right network of people around you, so you can really make a brilliant startup. So there's no one perfect place to start, but you'll know inside when you've done enough of those experiences to really make success So you happen. advise most, most students to say, try out things, join a startup for a while, maybe join a bigger company, see if you like it. Yes. And see where you fit. Absolutely. Find out what works best for you and make sure you're learning. But let's say you're in a big company, make sure you're not just constrained to that little box. Make sure you're talking to the person next to you, talking to another, um, you know, another group doing another thing. Make sure you network so you can learn at a big company. A big company is not just about doing that one function, but it's a, you know, it's a smorgasbord of things you can learn from if you choose to go off and do yeah. that. And you have to take advantage of those resources. I mean, you grew up in, in Detroit, and I grew up in Germany, and what you're telling me right now seems to be exactly the opposite of what I learned. What I learned was, Pick yourself a safe spot, like go to a big company, and once you have that spot, stay there as long as you can. In fact, being tenured at a university is exactly this. Stay there <laughs> exactly. as long as you can. So how come you're, you, you see this so differently, and, and what can we learn from that? 
Well, I think, you know, sure, things are safe. You, 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 people want you to be safe. You know, like I said, my mom was crying going, why are you going to this little company I've never heard of? You should be going work for IBM or something where it's safe because I want you to be safe. I think the way the world changes is not by people being safe, but by challenging expectations, challenging the conventional wisdom. And if you want to change the world, you need to get out of the, 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 the area of safeness. You know, it was thought back in, you know, in the 40s, 40s to the 60s, 70s, that companies could take care of you now. Companies can't take care of you any longer. That was a myth, and we're seeing that everywhere. You have to understand that change is going to be constant in your life, and you have to adapt to change, whether it's in a big company or a small company. Say you work in a big company today. Can you do this inside a big company, or do you have to break out and start something else, join somebody else? I've started companies with just myself as an independent. I've started three, three divisions of companies inside of very large companies. It can like be Apple. done anywhere. It can be done anywhere under any means. There is no one rule for this. Um, something, there's pros and cons to everything. So no one right way, but again, if you have great leaders of a big company, they're gonna see your passion if they're great and they're gonna actually try to nurture it and help grow because they need to grow and they yeah. need great, great talent. Gabby asked a question which is very related. You might have already answered it. Um, he says, do you think it's possible to find fulfillment by working for a company or do you think founding your own company and being CEO brings more fulfillment? Fulfillment is in the eye of the beholder. You have to look for what you're trying to learn. You need to set your own goals, whether it's as a startup, as an independent, or inside a big company. I, the, my first question I ask, you can yeah. do, yeah, you and you can do either or. The big thing that I ask when I interview people is I say, what do you want to learn when you come here? What do you want to learn? Not what can you do for me, what do you want to learn? Because if you're always trying to learn, then I know you're trying to improve yourself and therefore you're going to help the company improve as well. When you, that's a great lead away to a question I have for you, Tony. I'm not going to okay. take part of it from the script here. But when you interview people, how do you pick them? You just mentioned this one question. Like, how do you assess whether people are really willing to learn or just trying to please you? Well, the other, the other thing I ask is about their background. So I go through their resume, or in, right. even if they yeah. don't have experience, you know, maybe some people don't have experience. I had very little experience when I came here. Um, was, how did you pick your major? How did you discover you wanting to do what you really want to do? How did you know when you wanted to become an engineer or a, you know, a doctor or whatever? I always want to see that insight. Do they understand what their gut is telling them? Can they articulate that? And then you can understand if they're really about pleasing you or, or trying to challenge themselves and get better. And so that's a, you have to you really want, listen clo closely. You want the people who then go to their gut and really want to be open to learning and open to failure. Absolutely, open to failure. They, uh, peop, you know, we don't learn to walk when we, we learn to walk. We don't walk when we come out of the womb. We have to learn everything and there's failure along the way. And you have to understand those moments of adversity and those moments of triumph and how those people dealt with it. And that's the way I can assess, I think I can assess good talent. Because we're adaptable creatures. We can learn all kinds of things if we want to learn. That's so true. That's so true. A question from Enas. Do you feel you needed the Apple work experience that you of course had to start your own company? Do you think if you started up your own company years earlier, which I guess you did, in the egg delivery business. In and others. egg delivery first. <laughs> in the education company. Could you have done equally well? If you, if you were to take out this, this phase of you, we had this amazing impact at Apple and, and invented these wonderful things, but it didn't have it, would Nest have come out the same way? I don't think it'd be the same, but I think it might have, it would have existed, absolutely. You know, uh, people look inside of Apple and it's an incredible company with incredible talent and processes in that way, but there's lots of incredible companies out there. And again, you know, I learned a lot of the things at General Magic. That wasn't Apple. I learned it at General Magic, or I learned it at Philips Electronics. Every single place you go, there's always something you can learn. You just have to be tuned into it. And so, yeah, I learned a lot of great things at Apple. Um, but at the end of the day, it boiled down to tenacity, the people you know, and the things you knew um, through your experiences. You can't build a new company without not understanding yourself, but also knowing a network of people who can help you build it. Because most companies are not just one person, it's a yeah, group of people. That's very true. And you need to have a network of people to help you mm. and empower them to, yeah. to help you. Tony, you are a world-class designer. You won awards for your work and design. 
and you led teams. And I, when I ask you about Nest, uh, you often tell me that you see yourself as a chief designer and as the CEO, and you are, obviously. Um, here's a, a question from Duncan. When you design a product, uh, Tony, how do you decide whether to include a feature or c cut a feature? I have to smile because <laughs> 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 this is we the perennial question of every CEO. How whether to include a feature or whether to cut a feature. Right. Are there rules that you follow? Yes, there are absolutely rules. No, no they are, but tell us what the rules are. I will are. tell you the Enlighten rules. Us. So we have to talk, we, first you have to segment out, are you a business to business product? or service, or are you a business to consumer product? It's very different things. So if you're trying to sell to another corporation, usually that corporation will tell you what they want and what they don't want. So it's pretty easy. So you're like, I need to cut this feature, I need to include this feature because I'm going to make a sale. I'm going to get a customer from it. So it's a, it, not that it's easy by any means, I'm not trying to say it, but you, luckily you have somebody who's right there and you can assess what you really should do. Now, on the business to consumer side, like an Apple or a Google or something like that, you say, I have, you know, the team has to preordain and figure out what those customers will want. You're not going to talk to all of them. So you have to figure out how you're going to communicate to that consumer what they're going to get. And you only have three or four top things that you can communicate. Many engineers sit there and they say they need a litany, they need 30, 40 different features to be able to sell something. The problem is consumers only have a very limited amount of time. This company, General Magic, that I started with, we spent four years building something because we thought we needed every single feature. General Magic lost a billion dollars and it was one of the biggest failures in Silicon Valley because we put too many features in and it took four hours to explain what the product was. You have to remember, people have very limited time. You only have three or four things amazing things you can tell people it about. It makes me really wonder what happens in these television companies when the Designers discuss the design of remote controls. Right, right. And I've never seen a remote control where over the lifetime I used every single button. It and I don't, don't know what they mean. <laughs> well, look at a car. Cars also have redundant buttons. Yeah. There's people over design. And what I find is in, in design is that engineers try, especially in the, in the uh, early days of their career, and I, this even happened to General Magic and me, we would sit there and we would try to impress the person next to us. We would try to say, I'm going to make something so cool that they're impressed. And then they go, wow, that's really cool. And they want to do it again and again. But what you're doing is you're impressing and making features for somebody who really understands and, they, you know, and it gets really geeky. What your job is as a great engineer and designer is to not make things for the engineer next to you, but it's to make it for the common person who doesn't understand the technology the, the way you do to make it communicate, so you can communicate, this is what it does. And what you also do is you make sure that, that um, how can I put this? Um, that the product itself is empowering that person. You're giving that person who buying that product a superpower. You've made it so simple for them. You've taken this great robust technology and made it so simple for them they use it and they feel like they have a new superpower they've never had. Google was a perfect example, yeah. right? So our job as engineers and as designers is to give superpowers to our consumers, make the technology so simple but so powerful that this person feels enabled that they've never seen empowered. But then I have to ask this question. Now Beck is Tony, not a world-class designer, but Tony is a world-class CEO. Before you launch, say before you launch a Nest thermostats, the only person I can impress as an engineer is the person next to me. How do, you, how do you get that DNA that you just talked about into your staff, into your team? Well, I think the first and foremost thing is you have to mentor your staff to say, you need to come in with your hat, a beginner hat on every day. What is, you know, we look at all the designs, we look at all the details every day and we get, you know, um, nuanced of how we're gonna, how we're gonna make a decision. We have to come back with, step, take a step back. The, I am a new user. I've never seen this before. Explain to me the very first step. Explain to me the second step. Explain to me the third step. But then I am a junior engineer and I'm surrounded by 30 people I wish to impress. And it's so easy to say, we need this. I came up with this great new feature, this extra new button we can put on. Right. How do you get a team to say no? Well, so there are data-driven decisions 
and there are, uh, there are data-driven decisions and there's opinion-based decisions, yeah. okay? You must have a, a one or a small team of people who are in charge of the, the opinion-based decisions, and they're the ones who are gonna carry the vision to make sure it's gonna stay intact all the way to market. So data-driven decisions are easy because everyone can see what the right thing to do is. Opinion, you need a small one or a couple people who are going to be the guiding light and that's where you either see a visionary CEO, what that is, or a small product design team, and then they help to work with everybody to educate why it is, what we're building, what it is for the consumer, and they're the ones who can help shape and mold it. Nice. So we're getting online question on this iPad, and this is a question from a student named Dell. Hi, Dell. What is the secret to survival after a failure? No, of course, you never fail. You wouldn't know this, but my God. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so I, like I could write B20 tones. for Dell and outsmart everybody else, and that's it. <laughs> you know, a failure. You know, and any time there's a failure, you have to look into it. You know, like General Magic, like I said. You know, there's always success in failure. You just have to know where to look for it. And that means that's a learning moment. So you say every failure is success in learning if you know how to learn. Exactly. You just have to look for it. Because then you use that again and you make sure you don't make that mistake again or don't allow that mistake to happen. So your goal is to then, just because it didn't work out the way you wanted to, take that knowledge, take those learnings and reapply it to a new, you know, a new direction. And therefore you're going to get better. No one's, you know, I, you've had failure, I've had failure. And it takes years of building up that kind of thick skin around you of really understanding what it is, right? You know, like I said, you had to fall down many times learning to walk and run. You're going to do the same thing in life. And I'm sure Don't. I cried. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to bruise yourself. You're going to break your yeah. bones, what have you. But that's what it means to be resilient. You just get up and you keep going. And, you, and, and I can't tell you there's been times when I just sat there and I was like, oh, the world's going to be over. And then, you know what? You just look at it and you think about it and you have to project yourself, not today, but to project yourself into the future. What could I do in the future? If you keep looking ahead, that's, you know, don't get target fixation. Don't look here or you're gonna hit the tree. So what you're saying look is forward. Your look dopamine forward. in your brain doesn't come just from the superficial success, but from the learning success. From the learning success. So Absolutely. if you fail, you're really happy because you're never gonna make the same mistake again. Exactly, and look forward, keep looking forward. It's in great. the past, everybody fails. You're not the only one, everybody does. Just get over it, keep going. It's such a great attitude. Uh, here's a technical question from Sarah, uh, which is offline. What made you change from creating iPods, which you're very famous for, to creating thermostats, which you're also very famous for? It looks like, at least at the, at the surface, these products seem completely different. Well, they are, well, they're on the surface level and the markets, everything are completely different. The difference is, and I, I said earlier, is it first started with frustration. So the iPod was born out of, for me, the frustration I had as a DJ. I had to carry all these CDs around. <laughs> I was mad, I was frustrated. I couldn't get all the music I wanted. It was heavy, it was cumbersome. I had to go find things. And I couldn't be as good a DJ as I wanted. So I, well, that was the frustration, my curiosity, and then solution. The thermostat. I was sick and tired of paying so much money for, uh, uh, for, for energy to, to heat my home or cool my home, and yet it wasn't very comfortable. And every time I left, it, you know, it didn't turn off, and I was just pissed. I was mad. So, you know, 50% of the money we spent on energy every year was due to this thermostat. Yeah. And it was ugly. So I was frustrated, then curious, then solution. It's interesting because the thermostat, I think, broke many of the rules in Silicon Valley. If, I, if, if you'd asked me, I guess you did ask me. I, <laughs> you, you were an advisor. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would have said, look, there's things to turn around quickly like your meal, your, your, your phone, your pen, and then things that turn around very, very slowly, including your education, your car. Your car, your home. Your home. And as a result, if the turnover cycle is slow, how can you get a fast innovation cycle going in a slow turnaround market? But you defy the odds completely, I would say. I was actually <laughs> stunned you did. Thank you. Thank you. But you know, it was because of the fact that people every month would get a bill an energy bill, and they would just be frustrated and they just had to you know, pay it. 
and they were just they didn't know what they were doing. It was just like, ah, oh, I gotta pay this, and they just couldn't take it. So each month when they get that bill, that's the frustration. We just had to make sure we had a great product that could deliver on the marketing message and make sure they heard the message, whether they were in a store or online or what have you. So we just had to tap in, and I call this the virus of doubt. What's the pain point? And make sure you're a, 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 a painkiller, not a vitamin. So the pain was the energy bill, and then we said we had, a, we had the, the antidote for that. Yeah. And the pain came every month. That's true. But you also made it look beautiful. Really you have beautiful. to make it look beautiful. So for me, I bought maybe 30 of those, I have to admit. <laughs> and then I got a special deal from you. I paid full retail price. I gave half away as gifts to people. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> it's one of the most beautiful gifts to give, honestly, Nest. And what I enjoy about the, the thermostat in particular is just a, just a piece of jewelry on your wall. It's so nice to see it and smile Thank at you. you. Thank you. And make it so easy to use. I think, that, I mean, this is the brilliance of, of your engineering. That Thank you. That you solve a big energy problem for the nation. I, I, if everybody had one, you could probably reduce by how much percent so right now nation's energy? So right now in a home, um, fifth, at least 15% we could save in homes yeah. of energy. And we've saved over 7 billion kilowatt hours. And people are, not, are still That's comfortable. That's huge. Huge. That is huge. huge. More than many politicians could be able to save through speeches. <laughs> <laughs> they waste more. <laughs> <laughs> Here's an online question from James who asks about Internet of Things. And he wants to be, uh, get your assessment of the valuable, of valuability, as I guess, of a business. Um, he wonders if, if it's better to be in IT, IoT devices or more the data business right now. Like if you were to start something, want to be in the data business or in the device business? I think that, you know, each... each I, it's a general question. Either one can work. Either one can work. It's what you're passionate about. Again, people always start to go from, you know, they go with the biggest market and then they try to form their business around this biggest market and they go find the problems. And then they solve them, but they're not really passionate about solving them. They're solving them for money. Yeah. The difference is, is when you solve them for your frustration, you go after it and then if you work really hard and you put all the passion and love into that product, whether it's a software hardware product or a data product, whatever it is, people will feel that passion when they use it. Yeah. And that's the way the money will come. Stop looking at the money and going to find the solution. Start with the problem. Go intelligently deliver that solution that's meaningful and, and that's true and then the customers will come. I love how you say this because I think from the outside, Silicon Valley is often perceived as a as a money-making machine. Like you see a sale of WhatsApp to, to Facebook for $18 billion and everybody scratches 19. their head. $19 billion, you're right, plus retention bonuses. Um, and says, oh, these guys get really rich and I want to get rich. But you're saying something else. You're saying something completely different. Absolutely. You know, when I started, the, when I started thinking about Nest, I told my wife, Fanny, yeah. and she goes, you're absolutely crazy. A thermostat? How is that going to be like an iPod? You're not going to make a lot of money. I'm like, I'm telling you. I'm, and then I explained in five minutes. She goes, that's a great idea. It's a world impact. It really makes... And I we mean, wanted a win-win-win. And then if we won on energy for, for, and the environment and we made people happy and more comfortable, we're going to win as a company. Yeah. So if you make other people the winners, they're going to reward you. I and that was that all that was it about. It wasn't about, you know, I could have gone and done a different iPod or a different thing because I was chasing the money. It was chasing the passion, the, you know, the thing that I really wanted to fix, that I thought was meaningful. And yeah. then the world lined up. Ahmed is asking a question. After or when having an idea in my mind, when he has an idea, what is the best practice to, to apply the idea and, and, and implement it and execute? Idea? Well, like how do you go about checking how viable this do you just well, start you, a company right away? Do you no, ask no, your parents? When we did, when, don't ask your parents. <laughs> your parents are always going to validate you. That's a great idea. Do never ask your parents if it's a good idea or not. Ask you have your great spouse, parents. Ask your spouse. I have great parents, but don't ask them. Because they're always going to say, that's wonderful, honey. It's great. They, they love you unconditionally. Whether it's a good idea or a bad idea, they're going to say it's great. You're saying your spouse is the opposite? Spouse is the opposite. <laughs> they should be. They should be truthful. That's what you want is a great partner. So... Um, no, it starts with an idea, and in Nest, it took almost a whole year before we started the company. So what did you do in this year from like, I want to do a thermostat that's like reducing energy consumption. You saw this amazing ways of the air conditioner running all day when people aren't at home, to finally incorporating and, and raising money. 
Right, so I think the, the way that it first started was, well, how might I think I could solve this problem technically? So is it, do I have enough of the pieces? Do I know enough of the things? And I said, yeah, I know that because I had enough experience yeah. on that. So you first had to research enough about what you think would be built in. Then after that, you started researching the market. Like how, how many are sold? How do you do that? How do you, we have this great tool called Google. And we could sit there and Google yeah, but, all over. But then look, in thermostats at the time, I think thermostats lasted an average of about 20 years, 10 years. I don't know how long. Yes, 12 years. You must have come back and say, nah, not a market because no one ever buys a new thermostat unless they sell their home in the United that, States. That's true. New one. That's true. And then they go for the cheapest possible because they don't care about the next owners generally saying things. So you have to remember when you're disrupting an industry and if you have something dramatically different, if you have disruptive technology, then you can change a stagnated market. Yes. Like, let's take the iPod. There were MP3 players at the time. There were CD Walkmans and all those different things. But in the MP3 player market, if you looked at the size of the MP3 player market and you saw that it was a tiny little product for geeks, but if you looked at all the problems with that product, but if you also looked at the promise of the product and said they didn't meet, you said, wait a second, this could be a lot better. So don't point to the market size point to the impact it could have if you do it right. So how do you do market research on something that doesn't have a market yet? That is a great question. So the, the way that I've seen it is that you, it's, you have to start with the idea, what are you changing, and you have to take bold steps in terms of making something and trying it. Now you have to test, lots of testing. So you would make something and then you would go to uh, you know, some of the industry leaders or some of the people you really trust who are knowledgeable about a given area. And you'd say, what do you think? What do you think? And then you start to, to set your risk level based on how big the market is or how, mo big the, how big you think the market might become. So did you go around to people and say, here's my drawing of the Nest thermostats, would you buy it? Uh, yeah, I did, but to people I trusted. Yeah. People who I, I really valued their opinion, like you. Yeah, right. I mean, I, I looked at it and I was blown away. I mean, I remember the day when you were introduced and you said I have this amazing product and I wanted to save, make my contribution to climate change. And climate I, change. I, and I, I couldn't guess what it was because <laughs> I, you said it's in every home. I said, well, and you can do it? He said, yes, I can. And then you, you showed me what it is and I was just really amazed. And that was machine learning before people knew what machine yeah. learning was. I was like, what's happening today? You, you were the first. Well, <laughs> One you helped. First. You helped, <laughs> but, you know, absolutely. That was... Uh, so you have to look at the disruptive technology and how it could take an existing industry or that the moves. There, there's not too many things that come up that do, are not going to disrupt an industry, that you're not going to take customers from this place over here. Typically, most things that you build are going to take customers from some place and displace them to yours. So you can kind of figure out what the market size might become over time. Interesting. I mean, since we're talking about it, can you give us, can I ask you a question to give us a bit of the vision of Internet of Things, say, 20 years from now? 20 things. Well, let me, let me tell you, you know, like Internet of Things is a very big, broad vision. Let's just talk about the home. Right. Let's talk about Good. the home. So in the home, you know, when, when I was growing up, what did you do when you went into the home? You, when you went into back home? You would, you know, or when you left home? When you left home... Unlock the door. You, you unlock the door. You turn off the, the switch. You, you do all these different things. It's and what did you do? You would, put on, you would put on your jacket, <laughs> you would put on your shoes, and you'd walk out the door. Well, today you still turn off the lights and do all those other things, but you pick up your mobile phone, put on your jacket, put on your shoes, and you walk out the door. Right? Still the same thing. Same thing, except the mobile phone's with you. And now what we've been saying is the mobile phone is the way you're going to, to control everything when you're outside the home. But it's also the mobile phone's with you when you're inside the home at all times. Yeah. Right? It's this thing that's always with you. Well, I hope that in the home, we're going to get rid of mobile phones in the home. Why? Because mo what do mobile phones do? Yeah. They do this. I'm using it, and I'm, it's distancing between the loved ones. You got I your iPad right there. I don't right even there. know where my mobile phone is right now. Right. And, and it, but I if I'm looking at my mobile phone, I'm putting this between you and your loved ones. Yeah. My hope is that over the next 10 to 20 years, just like when you come home and you take off your shoes and you take off your jacket, you take your mobile phone and you throw it in the corner. 
And the home and the is still home there has, for you. And the home has, it's there. All those great resources, computing is there, but it's ambient. Voice recognition. Voice recognition. Uh, you know, we're, you're gonna, it's gonna recognize your gate, who's home. It's gonna recognize the voice of who's there. It's gonna uh, recognize which room you're in. And it's, the computing is going to be ambient around you. So even your PC disappears in the future. Even it's your to PC there. disappears. You look somewhere, and when you need it, you have it. And the only time you're going to have a display is when you're going to do group viewing. So you want to get around and watch a movie or do what have, do what have you as a family. Yeah. Our goal is to get rid of the, the technology barriers between you and your loved ones. You know what you're describing to me is as revolutionary as going from a typewriter to a computer? I'm sure if you sat in a room of people with typewriters and tell them this is a computer and it's going to be connected, and you can browse other people's websites, that would sound completely crazy. Yeah, exactly. And I think in the home, we're still in this age where we, we operate our home exactly like our typewriters. Absolutely. And, and, the, and we're getting to the point where we're going to be able to stop making them typewriters, making them desktop computers. Yeah. Hopefully soon, it's going to become a mobile phone in the home, but it's going to be ambient. It's going to be all around you, and that mobile phone is going to be ditched only when you're on the road. So you would say you're only one, two, three percent into the Internet of Things, or the more intelligent. Oh, we home. are at the very earliest, earliest days. This is this is like the app. We're right at now at the Apple two days of the <laughs> Internet of Things in the home. That's true. We just left Apple one things to nest. It's true. We <laughs> now just we can got actually there. buy initial devices. That's something great for our students because if you put this together with the question of what makes you uncomfortable, there's so many things I hate about my home <laughs> that I'd have to fix. So many great startup companies to be built. Such a great field to be in. I want to uh, take another online question from Josef. By chance, do you have a recipe <laughs> to becoming addicted to learning? Addicted to learning? Wow. I, you know, I think, I think it's innate. I think it's innate. I think it's always asking questions. Like, well, you don't have to take a course to learn. You learn from each other, right? It's always about asking, you know, lots of people like to tell themselves, talk about themselves with everyone. I, I learned back in when I was in high school, how, listen more, how, listen more. How can you do this? So when I grew up in Germany, my professors would never, ever ask a question because as a professor, I'm supposed to you be know the everything. oracle. You know everything. So our role models did the opposite. So how, how, how did you manage to escape that? You know, I went to 12 different schools in 15 years. Really? I went to 12 different schools. They didn't kick you all out, did they? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> My father was on the lamp. No, no, no. But no, seriously. So every time I was always learning because I was always in a new environment. I never was a master of in my environment because it was always changing. You should never think you're a master of in a, your environment. This is about staying beginners to know what kind of product you're going to make. You always have to just question. And if you, so there's two things. So one is always question. And if you're always questioning, that means you're curious, and that means you're gonna, you have the potential to learn if you listen, okay? And listen to others that are around to, 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 to gain knowledge from them. And the other one is just keep trying, keep listening, keep learning, and apply that knowledge. And keep applying that knowledge, and as you dig deeper, you're gonna find there's more things to learn, and more things to learn. Stay curious. What a great challenge to all our students. Um, let's see, um, there's another question from Roger. What do you see as key steps or habits to converting ideas into reality? I guess the question we already talked about a little bit. Persistence. Persistence. So after the learning and the curiosity, yeah. it's just keep trying, keep trying. You know, Nest, Nest, the thermostat wasn't the first idea I had no? for Nest. <laughs> it was the third idea I had for Nest. So, and we're getting around to all those other ideas. It was, yeah, that was the most them. important. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about it, but that was the most important <laughs> idea. But it was always just that, like, yeah. it, there was not enough in my gut saying that was there was enough. When you say keep persistence, I can't help but pointing out that you tell people, uh, students, keep learning and be persistent. And those could be contradictory. Like, if I think I have the right solution and just want to get it going, it's really easy to fall into this, this local minimum where I just blindly do the same thing over and over and hammer the same nail well over again. Well, that's called insanity. But, but people, people do this. Like, what are you persistent about? So there are times when you're learning and then you're persistent to getting to an answer. Then you go back to learning. So it's a phased approach. So it's persistent to go to an answer. Right. So you have an hypothesis, you test the hypothesis, and you make a new hypothesis, then you keep going. So you, it's a process. So you have to know when to step on the gas or when you put on the brakes to learn, then you step on the gas to do. But it's, how it's important, an iterative process. How important is a vision for this process, like a, a distant goal that you would accomplish? You always have to have a North Star. 
Hmm. You always have to know where you're going. Now, you're not going to get there straight, but you have to, and your North Star will change over time as you learn and, and adapt. But you should always know what you're trying to go for, and it shouldn't be for money. You mm -hmm. should be going for what, you, what thing you're trying to solve for. Right? And maybe it's the wrong thing, but you'll learn over time. So Here's a question that's close to my heart uh, as I'm turning 49 today. And the question is um, from AJ. What is your advice for someone over 50 years old to transition into new technologies? Oh, wow. Because we have a lot of learners of all trades of life and university, and they come to us at all ages. And that's wonderful. It's great. It's and wonderful. No, in fact, I would argue today's society, lifelong learning is not a big, big thing that we propagate. But we've seen many students in university taking one career and then after 20 years of one career, go to new career. But when being asked, is there a chance for somebody age 50? What, what do you advise? Absolutely. You know, I, I said earlier, you know, if you're going to a great company who understands how to interview people and, and, under, and, and, and understand their innate potential, if you've had success and you've shown success and learning along the ways of failure out of, or success out of failure, they're going to see that and they're going to see your passion because it's no different than wanting to when you were 20 years old, when you, when you didn't know anything, yeah. right? So if you have a career and you just say, I'm switching careers or I'm changing it, but you're taking this wealth of knowledge into a new domain, a lot of the, the thing with employers is that they always want multidisciplinary people. Yeah. They want people from all kinds of different That's backgrounds to bring it there. So if they see, oh my God, you have this wealth of knowledge from this other thing that's gonna help me with my, my, my whatever I'm creating, and you wanna learn this too, they're going, I wanna learn from you your, your experience, and you're gonna learn from me this new experience you wanna learn. If it's a, a, uh, a two-way street of learning, yes. both parties, well, both parties are, uh, succeed together, and that's what creates a great bond and creates a great product or a great service. Tony, we're almost out of time, and I find your answers incredibly insightful, <laughs> I have to admit. I learned so much just from talking to you. I want to ask you one last question. Tell us something that no one really knows about, something that you experienced in your life that you would even look back and say, my God. The Charlie Rose question, huh? Um, let's see. What, what would I, what can I tell? Hmm. Just tell you a story or something yeah, about it? some interesting story. Some interesting story. I mean, you're, you're being viewed as the superhero, the person who turns everything into gold, who is not just great, a great CEO, one oh of the best my of my. his times, but also a great designer, a great hardware person, a great software person. I, I mean, I, I'm like just human. I'm just human. Right. I'm just human. No, the, I think the biggest thing, it's all about the people. It's all about the people you, you work with. They become your friends. Those friends become people that you, you trust. Again, this whole curiosity and learning and, and doing, you cr you're a magnet for these different types of people, right? And they will be there to support you when you fail and they'll help you learn. And then when they're trying to do something, you're gonna be there for them. The biggest thing is about all of us working together to support each other, because that's what really good about it. So for me, my, my love is that general magic right here downstairs, when it was here, I was the lowest guy on the totem pole. I came to Silicon Valley. I didn't know no one. These people helped me become who I was today. Andy Hertzfeld, Joanna Hoffman, yes. Susan Kerr. Susan Kerr was pregnant at the time when I was 22 when I came to General Magic. She had a baby. Her baby, her name was Harry. Guess what? Harry is now at Nest, and he was one of the biggest, best performers you could ever imagine, and he's in his 20s passionate, a learner, and that's the generational effect. First it started with his mother, she transferred that to me, now I'm helping her son. And that's what Silicon Valley's about, and that's what life's about. Lifelong learning, and you not, not just learning, but also mentoring, and I'm learning more from Harry than he's probably learning from me. And that's, that's the magic of what, how I get to be successful. It's through others, and I help them make success as well. Tony, it's been an incredible privilege and wonderful learning experience for me to have you on our very, very first inaugural Udacity Talks. We will have our next, uh, next guest will be Astro Teller, who is the captain of Moonshots at Google X and also a good friend of mine. But I, and it's going to be on June 1st, so please sign up today. But thank you so much for coming. It's been a privilege. Sebastian, you're a good friend, and I can't thank you enough for today. I'm learning as well, so thank you.
Thank you. Congratulations on all Udacity success. Congratulations to all your successes.